information contained in today's um, presentation and accompanying materials are for informational purposes only and does not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the University of Kentucky Human Development Institute or individual employees. Although we attempt to provide accessible, accurate, and current information, no guarantees are made to that effect. So let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And you can see today's objectives where we're going to review the VR tech um, quality employment purpose here, how COVID-19 has impacted the employment of people with disabilities, as well as key strategies for inclusion. And let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. And I am excited to share next month, our April Employer Seminar Series will be in partnership with Kentucky's Employment First. And um, it is going to be navigating employer responsibilities under ADA Title I, April 23rd. Um, we are going to have a a little bit longer block of time from noon to 12.45. We're gonna try that out and see if um, uh, everyone is able to stay with us. And the participant re uh, registration is also in the chat. And uh, Barry Whaley and Pam Williamson from Southeast ADA are gonna share their expertise about topics like ADA protections for individuals with substance use disorder and how ADA impacts collective bargaining agreements amongst other things. So please join us if you are able. And we're gonna go ahead and move on to um, our subject matter expert today. And um, that is Dr. Tim Tanzi. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Tanzi received his PhD in rehab psychology from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and he is a professor in the rehab counselor education program at the University of Wisconsin, Madison. With almost 30 years experience as a rehab counselor, educator, or rehabilitation researcher, and he's published over 110 peer-reviewed articles in the areas of applying novel technology and vocational rehabilitation and rehabilitation counselor education, evidence-based practices in vocational rehabilitation, self-regulation, and self-determination. Dr. Tanzi has extensive experience in adapting technology and utilizing social media for knowledge translation and dissemination activities. Dr. Tanzi is the principal investigator on the Vocational Rehabilitation Technical Assistance Center for Quality Employment, a project sponsored by the U.S. Department of Education. He is currently the principal investigator, co-principal investigator, or co-investigator on several other federally funded research or national technical assistance center grants from the U.S. Department of Education, U.S. Department of Labor, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Social Security Administration, and the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. These projects seek to ascertain evidence-based practices in the vocational rehabilitation of youth with disabilities, identify employer practices in the recruitment, hiring, retention, and promotion of persons with disabilities, and provide technical assistance to state vocational rehabilitation for an increasing competitive, integrated employment of persons with disabilities living in areas of extreme poverty. Dr. Tianzi has developed doctoral level training focused on online and hybrid pedagogy, as well as established numerous online hybrid and technology enhanced courses. He also serves as the co-editor of the Rehabilitation Counseling Bulletin and on the editorial boards for numerous other journals. So with that, Thank you so much um, for joining us, Dr. Tanzi. I feel a little guilty knowing all these other responsibilities that you have, um, pulling you away from those and asking you to, to spend some time with us today, but I'm so happy that you um, agreed and were able to do so. So thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to you at this time. All right. Thank you, Kimberly. And again, thank you for your patience as I do get uh, behind and getting things to you. Uh, again, just to recap, uh, my name is Tim Tanzi. Um, I'm a white size gender male uh, uh, wearing a blue shirt. And for a backdrop, I have a what I believe is a beautiful library. I'd love to tell you that this is my home library and that I really stretched that Home Depot gift card. But unfortunately, this is just a, a stock image. Um, and my preferred pronouns are, are he, him and his. 
Uh, would like to talk to you a bit today about the, the work that we're doing under the uh, Vocational Rehabilitation Technical Assistance Center for quality employment as it relates to the hiring and retention of individuals with disabilities, and in particular supports for businesses um, uh, under that program. Uh, kind of moving quickly, and I'll try to move quickly because you know, get through some of the, the, the boilerplate slides, uh, but generally the goal of this center is, is really focused around increasing the number and quality of employment outcomes for individuals with disabilities through training and technical assistance to state vocational rehabilitation agency personnel uh, and their uh, uh, affiliates. And we do this through really trying to identify uh, and implement with agencies innovative and effective employment strategies and supporting practices of which uh, businesses are an important component in terms of the dual customer model. Uh, we've got a, a broad range of partners that are involved in this project. And again, if you see your favorite university here, you can give it a shout out, um, but I'll keep moving forward uh, just to get to the primary content. Um, as always, uh, again, uh, the ideas, opinions, and conclusions expressed um, in this are, are mine and mine alone and do not represent recommendations, endorsements, or policies of the U.S. Department of Education. Um, so, that's a really quick rundown. And again, I wanted to try to get through that part to get to, I think, some, some interesting pieces here. Um, so this center uh, basically started in 2020, um, right at the height of, of the pandemic. And, and, and really started, you know, initially, um, we were focused on you know, what impact did the pandemic have in terms of, of uh, employment for individuals with disabilities? Well, we all have a pretty good idea of what impact it had on on the general U.S. economy? The certainly the slowdown, uh, you know, in, uh, businesses utilizing PPP as a way to support and maintain certain levels of of staffing and business operations. Um, but for those individuals that maybe weren't not in the labor market at that point or trying to get in the labor market, um, it, it certainly had a, a a fairly pronounced impact on. Um, opportunities for service provision, um, opportunities for employment over time. Um, and so that while we saw many, many groups um, benefiting from the robust economy um, and, and return to the labor force after the pandemic, um, we still see kind of a lagging effect of individuals with disabilities to some extent. Um, and there's this on, you know, going kind of concerns about, you know, if, if when hiring an individual with a disability, um, you know, what are the issues? What are the barriers that might prevent uh, businesses from doing so? So we continue to look at things such as the employment rate. So uh, when we think of data is a little dated now. I think we have a new study coming out on, on what is the employment rate. But if we kind of look within about a year and a half after the start of the pandemic, um, the employment to population ratio of persons with disabilities was right around 30%. Um, the employment rate among uh, those individuals without disabilities was about 72 percent. Um, and so, we're, we, again, there's a lot of reasons why that employment gap persists. Um, there's a lot of ways, reasons why it was there to be, you know, at this level to, to start. But, you know, one of the goals, I think, was, as a center is, is looking at how do we start shrinking this gap. And certainly, uh, we, 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 we recognizing um, national labor shortages in almost every sector of the U.S. economy. Um, what is the role that individuals with disabilities, who are really this group that is an untapped or underutilized labor market or labor pool of labor, how do we increase the percentage of individuals with disabilities and um, really working at, at multiple fronts? So looking at, um, you know, what are things that we're doing in terms of, of uh, those individuals to get them ready to think about it, work, think about what type of, of supports they might need to be successful at work, but then also working with um, individuals such as yourselves, businesses, to try to identify, you know, what are the uh, existing barriers, whether it be policy, uh, procedural, attitudinal, um, environmental, that might limit the uh, the 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 efficacy of, of bringing an individual with a disability into uh, a work setting um, in terms of. Uh, you know, uh, how things are approached in terms of whether it be job accommodations, whether it be um, talking with uh, uh, supervisors, hiring managers about uh, how to consider um, some you know, salient aspects that might affect an individual's long-term success. Um, so we do think about this intersection and, and, and we talk about, when we think about disability, um, we generally will talk about this intersection of race and poverty with that. Um, and uh, a lot of this is is that we think of individuals with disabilities. We know 
very clearly from the literature is that individuals with disabilities are much more likely to be experiencing poverty. So there's there's the experience of a disability is almost as a, as a very high association with uh, having limited economic means. Um, uh, likewise, we also recognize the intersection between race and poverty in terms of individuals from diverse groups uh, have a greater propensity of, of, of living in uh, poverty than uh, individuals of, uh, the, uh, uh, who are white. As a result, we, we also then see this other kind of facet where there's a greater association between race and disability due to, again, a number of factors, um, whether it be, we say, access to health care, um, living in an areas that may have experienced uh, increase. Uh, uh, crime or have increased uh, environmental hazards, um, all those kind of create, create this, this, um, this coalescing of these three different populations into a single group. Um, it also affects intersecting stigmas in terms of individuals with disabilities who are from racial and economic backgrounds tend to face uh, multiple social disadvantages in terms of, of living, um, opportunities for uh, where to live, um, what type of, 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 of uh, environment that those 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 housings are, are located in, but it also carries over into employment opportunities, education, and ultimately inter interpersonal relationships. And I know I'm speaking fast. I I, I just I got to keep on track with my time because I, I I've told that I've got to keep it to half an hour. And generally, when you give uh, uh, you know professors half an hour, they try to take at least an hour to get through everything. So um, I'm I'm going to try to keep on these as I go through. But you're doing great. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at my, you know, so I, I, I know how much time I have and, and, and to get through it. But so when we think about, and, you know, and, and so we actually look at points in time where um, employment significantly changed. So uh, we're still looking at things that are coming out of the, 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 the great pandemic or the, at least the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. But one of the ones that we have a really good idea about what's happened since, you know, uh, that event um, would be going back to the, the Great Recession in 2007 to 2009. So, um, you know, prior to that Great Recession, and in, in, in reason I'll preface this, um, we're looking at, at similar kind of changes in the national labor market, the national uh, approach to hiring of persons with disabilities to see what things have changed. And in, in some cases, these may be changing for the better, in some cases for the, um, to the latter. But if we go, you know, before that Great Recession, there there was this um, greater inclusion of persons with disabilities in the diversity uh, in companies' diversity inclusion policies and procedures. Um, the the focus really was on on ability, so not necessarily looking at an individual for their limitations, but looking at what value added that they had to uh, a company as far as being able to uh, promote uh, or incorporate individuals with. Uh, different abilities based on what they could actually, uh, what work they could perform for a company versus what work they couldn't do. Um, we also saw that there was, you know, again, uh, I think to some extent, a greater level of knowledge and experience in providing job accommodation and workplace supports. I think there was greater integration. Uh, and again, a lot of this comes back to looking at even uh, changing nature and roles of state vocational rehabilitation agencies that are working directly with, with different businesses to look at how do we support an individual that might have uh, a need for an accommodation um, to ultimately be successful in that workplace? Um, post Great Recession, we still see, you know, again, that greater use of, of, of disability in terms of diversity inclusion policies in the workplace. So, um, again, wonderful to see those kind of continue to grow. Um, the other caveat that we see is, is that there's actually a greater knowledge of the, the Americans with Disabilities Act. I think uh, businesses might have been had some trepidation about hiring. Uh, you know, even from the passage of the act in the 1990s all the way through the, to the Great Recession. But I think greater knowledge and in particularly um, we think about advancement of case law associated with the ADA and then subsequent changes associated with the ADA Restoration Act. Um, all those, you know, create, I think, a much greater understanding of, of what is, for example, what is defined as a reasonable accommodation? What are the employer obligations in terms of uh, both the hiring process and retention process? 
Um, you know, one of the things we saw post Great Recession was a, a greater approach in terms of an in-house disability management program. So uh, companies, rather than relying, let's say, on the public sector, the state vocation rehabilitation system, um, uh, saw, I think, a wealth of training, of, of, of particularly in, in their uh, human resources units, of how to not just uh, look at hiring of individuals with disabilities, but consistent with the Retain project, um, greater emphasis on disability management. So working with um, uh, our current employees that may acquire disability, um, whether it be job related or uh, just life related, um, something that happened outside of the workplace, um, how do we retain those employees and, and manage um, uh, their needs so that we're able to retain those employees that are, are valued employees, um, but not necessarily uh, looking to leave or go to a new new area. And again, continue to see this greater diversification of those diversity and inclusion policies. Um, we started to see some work also looking at, you know, how uh, uh, businesses were working in terms of some of the normal beliefs. So what was the, what was the top down impression really for lack of a better piece of, of how business as a whole were looking at where are we starting to think about that labor pool? How are we going to work with this very important group um, and unfortunately growing group of the U S labor market of individuals who have some type of significant impairment that ultimately is going to affect not necessarily their ability to work, but how they approach um, doing different work. And so as we started going through and thinking about um, some things that, that businesses may need or want, um, we really want to try to get a sense of, 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 you know, when we think about these policies, when we think of um, uh, whether it be diversity and inclusion or the various procedures, we really want to start getting a sense of, of uh, these are not certainly universal um, and that we know that there are, are certain businesses that are more effective in terms of, of hiring, but more so retention of persons with disabilities. So what, what are the things that we can start capturing from an environmental perspective that really give us an idea of, 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 of what companies are doing and what businesses are being more effective and what is the growth or trajectory for growth or change or improvement among other, other businesses. So as we kind of started looking at this, we started trying to put together what we called um, ultimately called the disability inclusion profile. Now I'm not good at acronyms. So uh, when I came with the title and then someone's like, Oh, we're going to call it the dip. I'm like, well, uh, let's be thoughtful. We'll call this idea of, of if, if you if you don't do a lot of hiring of or really of a purposeful plan as it relates to the hiring and retention of persons with disabilities, maybe we get people to dip their toe into the water, um, but but start moving into uh, this type of programming. Um, so in 2021, as a function of a, a federal project, uh, really want to come up with something that uh, companies uh, could could start getting some sense of. You know, are we on the right track? Are we moving in the right direction in terms of evaluation of our work environment as it's associated with this this piece of, of disability hiring and retention? Um, really liked uh, the original version of this, but then in 2022 through the VR TAC QE, uh, tried to take this uh, uh, profiler and and really turn it into an online self administered self reporting instrument, so that you don't have to go through me, you don't have to have uh, you know, you don't have to have someone, you know, looking at what your scores are and, and, and how things are being, you know, done at a specific company. It's really an idea for self-evaluation. Um, uh, so utilizing this tool, and if you, there's a link on the slide, um, but we can also make sure we get that link in the chat. Um, this is an opportunity to start looking at as a, as a business, you know, what are the areas for potential improvement? And I'll talk about the structure of the dip and some other activities here shortly. But uh, when we started thinking about this is we, we really wanted to kind of look at, first and foremost, identifying those disability inclusion practices that are related to employment um, and really also provide an, an idea of what practices uh, constitute an effective strategy in terms of, of building a working relationship with employers, whether it be between state agencies and employers, whether it be the individual employee with a disability um, and, and their, and their uh, company. Um, so we, we really went through and started reviewing what are some, some things that companies are doing. So we wanted to you know, find, uh, for example, which, uh, you know, can we help employers, um, first of all and foremost, assess kind of what are their existing policies? What are the policies that other, other companies in comparable areas or other companies of comparable size and scope? 
Uh, for example, we might expect something very different in terms of disability inclusion from and the resources uh, from a Fortune 500 company versus a small business. Um, what you know, what works for a small business it may not work for a large business. Just in, in conversely true. So, what are the various policies that are most common among those small employers? What are the po policies that are most common amongst larger employers? And so, individuals can kind of a, have more of an apples to apples comparison. Um, we wanted also to make sure that that anyone taking this this profile or have some sense of here's things that we're doing well. Here are areas for growth. Here are things that that we might be able to look at. And you know, given the the uh, the different areas, what are some recommendations that come out of this that we can choose to act on, um, or we can kind of uh, highlight or specialize which one of these areas we want to move forward with. <clears throat> Likewise, again, is is providing some idea about what are some some interventions that might be useful on a more global scale. Um, so it is intended to be a diagnostic tool. There's been a couple of articles that we've written about this, um, but this is really intended to, first of all, first and foremost, evaluate some of those policies, um, inform what potential training might be useful. And then uh, ultimately, in terms of collaboration with external entities, um, what are some of the supports that might be needed? What are some ways that we can identify ultimate workforce needs um, of the agency, I'm sorry, of the business, as well as agencies that can provide some supports to attain those? And I'm kind of jumping through a little bit just to get oh, back up on time and I hit an extra button. So how was this developed? Um, it started with uh, initially just reviewing the literature, um, what's been written um, across the board in terms of, of, of best practices in, in hiring and retention. Uh, we then uh, did what's called a focus group with uh, businesses to kind of identify what, what they've been working on, what are some of the key features of, of their own policies. And then ultimately, uh, what was called a Delphi study. And just to give you an idea very quickly, a Delphi study is we developed version A of the, the profiler, um, sent it out to uh, a, a group of employers. I believe we had about 20 employers um, in, in this group who said, this is a good idea. This is a bad idea. Do more of this or change this in this way. And you actually do subsequent iterations of, of okay, we've made these changes. Does this look better? Does it, are we on the right track? And so I believe there were four rounds of the ultimate Delphi where we kept editing and revising and sending it back out to try to make sure that both the content and the language used within is consistent with where businesses were at. Um, and so there was a validation part where we actually then sent this out and we had a, a group of uh, human resource managers, about 450 or 466 on the slide, um, who went through the, the actual initial version of the disability inclusion profiler. And the idea here was to get a sense of, of and looking at all these different characteristics. Um, so for example, uh, having disability specifically identified in the company diversity policy, um, was that important? Uh, did the human resources identify that as being something that was important? And then was it something that actually had been implemented? So. No, it's, it hasn't been done yet, but we think we, we want to do that. Um, we're, we've already got a plan and we just have to, to update the policy. Um, we identify maybe uh, uh, race and ethnicity and, and other diverse groups would be partial implementation, or if it specifically mentions disability, that would be considered full implementation. And wanted to get a sense from uh, roughly, again, 460 uh, businesses um, where were they at across all of these different factors and, and metrics that we put together? Um, so again, uh, we're able to run, again, uh, different analyses on this, but but, but really found out that um, uh, companies that had uh, higher scores on the disability inclusion profiler, um, it was associated with greater hiring of persons with disability. So by going through the profiler, if you got a high score, you were much more likely to be um, hiring. If you had a lower score and, and having a sample of about 460, we can actually do, you know, tell you where you are from a percentile percent, uh, perspective. So are you among the 90 percentile or higher of, of companies in the United States of a comparable size? Are you at the lower end? And it doesn't mean that that being at a lower end is, 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 is um, a problem. It's the idea of, well, how do I move to the next step and really providing ultimately businesses that if we do these things, we're likely to, to grow our capacity to hire, we're, we're going to grow our capacity to retain individuals over time. Um, when we think about it, the breakdowns, and I think these become important, um, we generally will always start with 
disability inclusion and retention and as far as business starts at the top. Um, so to what extent is the executive level, the senior management involved in, in focused on, the, on disability inclusion? Um, so this really tries to evaluate what is the senior leadership doing in this area? What are the things that they are focused on uh, ultimately to promote uh, disability hiring, including retention? And so we actually identify what are what do sex, successful companies do well, at the executive level? They're setting utilization goals for employment. Now they may be doing this in in context of uh, under the the Rehab Act in terms of if they're you know looking at uh, procuring federal contracts, but it's they are setting you know what is our goal as a company? How do we identify that we we're being affected in this area? Um, they conduct an annual review to make sure that they're on track. Um, they provide things such as uh, enterprise-wide for at least larger companies, uh, accommodations budget lines, so that if we need to pay for some type of accommodation, there's not a question of who pays for it. We're not necessarily going to the public agency, which is always always there to provide those services as well. Um, are we stepping forward and saying, here's funds to provide an accommodation, whether it be a specialized screen, specialized workplace um, setting, et cetera? Um, uh, again, companies that I think are, are more successful in, in hiring have an in-house disability management specialist, and they underscore the importance of disability inclusion training for all their staff. We also identify in here the mid-management level disability inclusion policies and things that we think are important for those individuals. They have a lot more direct contact with individuals with disabilities as part of frontline staff. Um, and again, there's a list here of different pieces. I know the slides are available. I know I've got three minutes left and three slides, so I'm going to keep track of that. Um, but uh, definitely would tell you if, if you're interested in the DIP, um, go and, and check out the, the website. Um, there's again, uh, it's, it's a free tool. Um, it's anonymous. So if you don't want anyone knowing that uh, you fill this out on behalf of your company and just indicate that I'd like to take this as anonymous and I don't want our name showing up on the report or where things are at. Um, the other thing I'd be remiss if I didn't bring up was that we do have an employer hub. And on this employer hub, similar to, I think, the, some of the work that the, the great project here in Kentucky at Retain does, um, there is a host of resources there in terms of just general workforce solutions. Uh, recruitment and hiring, information on, on how to talk about disability as a diversity component, um, specific retention strategies, uh, as well as even planning for the unexpected. So, for example, if you are in a building with stairs, do you have a, uh, a wheelchair capable, uh, 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 a stair capable wheelchair to help uh, evacuate people safely? So we do talk about disability um, uh, in a disaster preparedness standpoint, just so that, that again, it's another way to convey the importance of, of accommodation and accessibility, and particularly in areas that we may not think about. Uh, but these resources are available to businesses to support their staff, to human resources, and certainly available for review and download. All right, I got through everything. I had to get through quickly. I know I spoke fast. Um, I do have my contact information. Uh, I do have the general website here of, of uh, the uh, the the center. So please, you know, contact either one of those. Um, I'm guessing there are questions. So let's see here. I have one minute for questions, unless Kimberly, if you there are any information that you if you already have all these answered, then I won't worry about it. But thank you for your time. I know this was really fast with 30 minutes, so I'm used to a little bit longer. It was great content. Thank you so much. There were a few questions that I answered as you were um, speaking in the chat, but if anybody has questions now, feel free to put those in the chat. Just a few comments. Um, I've had the opportunity to, to do the disability inclusion profiler and, and kind of just look at it. Um, and I think it's a great tool for employers just to start thinking about where they sit. Um, and I, I love the fact that they can do it independently and um, kind of helps them think about where they are and where they want to be. And nobody else needs to have that information like you, you know, mentioned earlier. Um, the other thing that I thought was um, really impactful, you know, you talked about how you see employers who are, um, you know, really doing this once people are are recruited. We're even seeing employers who are looking to help people with accessibility and accommodations in the application and hiring process. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's thanks to 
um, tools like the disability inclusion profiler that employers are thinking about that. So um, I think, you know, while we have a ways to go, things like this really help us think about how to get there. Um, somebody said, excellent information, thanks. Business resource groups, affinity groups with a disability focus are becoming more common now. Yes, thanks, Willie. Um, Allison said, thank you for presenting. Great overview in a short amount of time. Great presentation. Um, so I think that's all um, everybody can agree. It's great information. The links are in the chat and you can um, see them here on the screen too. If you would like to get more information or reach out to Dr. Tanzi for more information. But thank you so much um, for joining us today and for sharing your expertise and resources. Thank you for the invitation and thank you all for attending and for your interest in, again, promoting greater diversity and inclusion in your workplaces.